living within Newcastle, Newcastle has a huge kind of coal history and they're thinking currently about a new way of kind of, I guess, putting back what, what they've taken. And this is a process called biochar and it's basically like roasting biological materials without air and this kind of mineralizes the carbon. But the interesting thing is you can actually get kind of uh, oils off this that you can actually burn. So at the same time as you're kind of um, uh, squirreling away carbon, you can actually get things that you could use to power artworks. So um, I'm at the start of trying to think about how I could use this kind of biochar to, to you know, power, I guess, small things like Arduino-based devices. Okay. And so, and also how to better use your energy because, you know, making electricity just to burn it in a resistor is maybe not the best way of using it. Okay, so that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So, <laughs> just to bookend the discussion a little bit, I thought I might uh, talk a little bit about how this relates to actual practice of mine. Um, we have some, <laughs> some quick demos and such. Brian talks. I have. So uh, just to uh, give us a little context in terms of where I'm coming from, this is where I work, uh, Newcastle University Cultural Center. We have a new uh, kind of research strand in all this stuff. Um, you know, for example, there's a, there's a couple of students that we have that want to do things like uh, outdoor environmental video um, installations, right? And what's the best way to do that in such a way that, for example, it could last forever or it could last at least a very long time? Um, so this whole research strand is something that, you know, is going to be ongoing. Um, so if anybody has any questions or issues in this vein, we'd love to work with you. Um, just to re remind us of the, the motivations I was listing at the beginning there, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of these. Uh, the first two I think of as sort of being quite legitimately and literally related to performance practice in a way, which were the idea of performance energy and that, again, that idea that essentially all electronic music in a sense does kind of just filter energy in some way. Um, and then systems ideas, which are the sort of larger issues, I think, like material autonomy and energy autonomy and how we're able to access stuff. So performance energy. What could that actually be like, of course, right? I can go on and on and be a smart ass about this stuff forever, but could you actually think of a way of conceptualizing a piece that either shows, especially in electronic music, um, or forces a performer into a state of you know, uh, exertion or performance energy? Some of you may have seen this piece, uh, which I did uh, quite a bit of performing of, which is a piece called Boombox, which is a large flight case, which has a bunch of sensors in it. And the idea is that you can't really get anything out of it in terms of music or sound until you've really exerted yourself. So I'll play a little excerpt of this.
event. So another version of this, or maybe a, a, a someone who I think is probably thinking in a similar way is uh, Toshimaru Nakamura, who some of you I'm sure have seen play or heard about. Uh, he does a piece called No Input Mixer, and a whole kind of series of pieces in a sense, almost like a, a little scene around uh, musical equipment that is used without uh, any kind of traditional sense of an input. Um, so it's feedback loops, it's, it's ways of just routing that power through the machine and then back out to a speaker. So material energy and autonomy, um, what's the literality of that? What, I mean, if we were actually going to make this stuff real instead of, um, you know, again, highlighting how much energy we use or, or whatever the, the metaphors are, um, is it possible? Could we do it? And so one piece I've done, uh, which has some musical implications, although it was, was presented as a, as a fine art piece at Exit Art in New York, um, is called Art Generator. Uh, and the idea was... Uh, um, you know, it doesn't generate art, but it generates power for art, although I, I kind of like the double meaning. Um, it is a generator that is powered by visitors to a gallery, and the gallery uh, piece itself is sort of sub-curated by me, where I asked other people to come in and make little pieces that would then hook up to the, to the generator. And so as you walked in, you were kind of asked to literally power it. I mean, you, you can think of it as like the electronic art community sort of powers itself through uh, attendance and, uh, and money and such, but I wanted people to actually impart their energy. Um, here's a Hopefully a quick video describes it a little bit. a battery 
and the battery is linked up to six other smaller art pieces that he had other artists produce. and the original idea for the show being called electric lab was to have a lab where artists could come in over the course of the exhibition and continue working on on pieces. and and jamie really took advantage of that and invited other artists to contribute to his piece. the rest of this is sort of an odd stage thing that the curator did but um you can see behind it there there's these sort of tower elements that are meant to look a little bit like power distribution. and some of the people that i asked at lovid were involved and a few other people uh greg shakar some of whom are you know sort of musical interface developers and so some of those pieces were kind of interactive music pieces uh somebody else who i was hoping to have here but um was too busy to come and uh is is uh regret regrets it so uh but rory nugent's uh square band was a piece that got quite a bit of internet kind of time if you will uh and uh, the idea is really is kind of a a, a localized personal sound maker that's solar driven that is in the form of a wristband and so those little i, I believe these are these are tonal kind of buttons and then you can vary uh volume and such but also the 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 amount of power obviously the way that the the amp works of course the sound is quite different depending on whether or not the amp's getting you know full power or somewhat somewhat less than that so it can be uh it's behavioral based on the, on the physical environment um a few other little pieces uh this is not little at all actually uh Jeff Pedersen is a guy who works with the transmission arts group uh, free 103.9 in New York and he did a piece where he tried to amplify um more or less tectonic and soil shifts uh in the earth and this is a perfect example of this kind of material and and not, I mean physical like autonomy idea this was to be installed at a place called the Wave Farm in upstate New York which I mean effectively it's just a big plot of land that they were able to get and um he wanted it to stay there forever without having to be um you know without any maintenance without any you know need for recharging batteries without any of that kind of thing and so how do you do that well he developed the whole system for the application that was also solar driven and and now it's there for you know forever which is a, i mean ostensibly forever but it i think that is kind of uh a really good example of, of the motivation around this that it, it may not have anything to do with quote unquote saving the world but it has a lot to do with your kind of artistic notions of longevity and you know um being in the world um this is a fun one that was recently presented at Ambi um Michel de Bruyne who uh, did a piece where he has a four person uh Ford Fiesta or something like a 1984 Ford of some kind and uh he put uh pedals in it and you and he drives it around the city so he's a little it's really fast it's driving <laughs> sketches and practicalities just to finish up. I've had some really good conversations with people individually and and again I'm hoping there will be some discussion after this but um a couple of things that have come up that I didn't even thought of until this this whole week um uh are listed here uh for some of them I had thought of. Um so technology options, right? Ben and Brian both discussed a few of these. Uh really what it comes down to for some of the things that I want to do uh are solar, right? So that's 
pretty common and, and, and known to most people. Uh, water, wind, in terms of an insulation environment, like there's, there's a lot of opportunity. I'm presently doing a piece uh, on the Blythe coast of northern England, um, which is a completely wind-driven sort of interactive sound and, and light insulation. Um, and then piezo, which is kind of the, the fancy um, version of kinetic energy harvesting. Uh, I have a little fun demo here, which is a, this is a company called MSI USA, which I believe has been purchased since I got this thing, but um, measurement specialties is what it says on it. Um, and the idea really is, is it's a bimorph. It's, a, it's, a, it's two pieces of, uh, of metal, essentially, although they're polymerized now, where if you, if you bend that metal at all, you get a voltage across the top of it, right? So this is a piece of uh, that stuff that has a little uh, incandescent bulb hooked up to it. So if I do this, I get a little glow, right? And that's a fair amount of energy. I mean, it, it does uh, obviously have its, there's some, the circuitry and stuff that you have to hook up to it obviously has this kind of uh, inefficiencies and such. Um, but those kinds of things are available. This is a, uh, a similar thing, which is a bimorph that has um, kind of a, a preset uh, uh, stress in it, right? And so if you flick it, it, has, it gives you much more energy as a result. That's a picture of another version of that here, which is made by a company called Face International in the US. If anybody wants any of these references, um, we can talk afterwards. But as you can see, there's sort of a, a, a pre-set um, metal bend into that thing. And so when you, when you push down on it, it actually flips back up and gives you far much more energy. So all these little incremental things. Uh, that company, by the way, uh, is involved in a really odd application of this, uh, which is smart bullets. Right, because you can put uh, piezo bimorphs on the side of a bullet, which then kind of flap as they go through the air, and they can power little brains that do things like find you. Um, yeah, I thought that was an amazing example. Um, and then you know the, the the kind of cranks and the pulleys and the bikes and the and the you know the uh, more mechanical type systems are also available. Uh, systems concern. This is the kind of stuff that I hadn't thought of before here. Like, what is the most energy efficient? OSC or MIDI? <laughs> stuff like that. Um, you know, when you get down to the point where you're making things that are battery powered or solar powered, you have to start worrying about data efficiency in terms of how much energy it expels, right? And so, you know, bytes become watts or milliwatts and, and stuff like that. So I just think those are interesting issues as well. This is a uh, little Bluetooth module, and that's a, a nickel cadmium battery, which are the best to recharge. In case anybody's interested. Um, the sine wave turntable, this thing sitting right here. So again, practicalities, right? Uh, if I'm going to start talking about capturing gesture in terms of a musical, musically interesting thing, what are some of the systems that actually create a fair amount of energy? Well, spinning things, yeah? Um, so Joel, Kazuhiro, and I, who presented on Tuesday, and is sitting right there. Uh, Last weekend, decided to try to do this in some way, and, and, and because we know that we were going to come visit Taku, we figured we'd make a turntable. The uh, idea here is, I mean, I think quite a, quite a, um, a big deal in a certain sense. Uh, we're taking the energy from the rotating record, uh, using a generator in order to generate enough energy to drive an amplifier, but then also using the generator sine wave itself as the feed into that amplifier, right? I'll show a circuit diagram in a sec. Um, here's Joe playing it in the lab. Oh. <laughs> He's already good at it. <laughs> so this is the idea, right? So you're taking an oscillator and a generator, and it, on one side, the top part here, is just generating, I mean, this is a, the top part of that is basically what all generator systems look like. It rectifies that signal, which comes off as a sine wave, and then it turns it in, it puts it into effectively what's a, what's a sort of short-term battery or an array of capacitors, and then gives that to the amplifier as power, but also uses the generator signal, which is again originally a sine wave, as the, the kind of sine wave uh, audio source for this whole thing. And so it's right here. We added a record, which Taku gave us. And let's see if I can get it. But with with, obvious, with different torque arms and such, you can kind of get more and less energy. So that's what it sounds like without the amplifier, right? Just directly driving a, uh, a kind of sine wave out of the thing. It's a nice soft sound. But then if we, oh, let me try it again. Because right now I'm storing energy. 
you kind of get that first burst right after it right after it uh, gets turned on. So when I'm doing this, I'm turning on the amp. <laughs> That's what I wanted. So a total sketch, right? But I mean, are these things uh, uh, giving us enough power with a better system? And obviously, this was really simply done. Um, with a better system for the capacitor array and the rectifier being more efficient, could we use it to drive a little sampler, a little chip that does, you know, bit tuning music or something? Um, which leads me into my next topic. When I first visited Stein, I think about five years ago or something, Michelle gave me a cracker box. I was pre fully prepared to buy one, and I, uh, I didn't because he gave me one, and I was really happy because it was just a really nice thing and it was a beautiful day. And so I went to the park. And I played it outside, and I got this kind of this moment of understanding this whole idea a little bit better uh, back then, um, where these sounds that came out of the cracker box were sitting in a park environment, and it really seemed to sort of spell something out to me in terms of the the, the facility that you could have for having new experiences with sort of things you're familiar with in new environments, right? And so I got really interested in trying to build things of that nature, and it's been a long time coming, and there's a lot of sketches in, in between, but one of the things I'm working on right now, which is not the sine wave turntable, but I forgot to change the bottom, is um, a set of things called circuit music machines, which are these guys, which are made out of wood, <laughs> recycled wood, um, and I'm gonna do six of them, and they're all going to have different kinds of kind of alternative energy power, right? So I'll have one that's piezo, one that's solar, one that's a crank, um, and then the variations <coughs> on those. Um, so uh, just in case you're wondering about the inspiration for the form, there's another portable device that I was really enamored with when I was a kid. Um, and uh, so that's what we're up to at the moment uh, at uh, our lab. So thanks a lot. I hope this wasn't too far afield for most of you, but I, I'm sure some of you have some questions or discussion topics. Um, so what do you think? Thanks for having us. Yes. Um, as you were speaking about the, the scientific um, world, knowing uh, a lot more about um, energy fields around objects and, and measuring them, how, how do you relate that to the, the in the 70s, the Korean topography in Russia, which was uh, purporting to measure uh, fields, electronic fields around all objects? <coughs> I don't know much about that, no. Is that the sort of ghost photography? Yeah, yeah it's... it's so called. Oh, okay. <laughs> Could you yeah. describe it a little bit more? Maybe we can uh, make up uh, an answer. It shows energy fields around all of the objects, and in particular at hands, and uh, they were doing a lot of uh, research <coughs> into, um, for example, the, the tactile feeling of blind people. Mm. That, uh, for example, color red would feel a lot scratchier and, and and so what, were, what was it they thought they were imaging? Like the, uh, well, the, it's called etheric fields. Oh, wow. So real methods. So that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid at all to show. Like, I, I think that's, that's the challenge here in a way, is to start thinking about, I mean, without getting new agey, although I, <laughs> if anyone wants to, that's fine. <laughs> it's, not, it's not my stuff. Um, <laughs> it, it, it seems like relating to energy in that kind of way is quite interesting to me. You know, like it is something that sort of is resonating within us all and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I'd be interested to know more about that. I don't know. No, it's, it's the, the sad thing about Korean photography and, and a lot of the aura stuff is it, it gets a lot to, uh, without, we can get a little too metaphysical and too um, religious on this, but, uh, you know, Carl Sagan once said that. Um, uh, you know, I don't need to believe in anything because everything is all around me and I'm already fascinated with that. And the same thing with things like Carillion photography and auras. The, the body itself does create, I mean, we sit here and measure it all the time. We, the body does create electromagnetic fields, um, MRI, you know, you can do all sorts of um, different analysis of the electric fields in the body that are very, very real. And, and um, the, the one way that I look at some of the, the early things with auras and stuff like that is... Um, is that they were they were wonderfully predictive of where we were going to go, but they're not accurate in where we went. Um, if you know what I mean. They're, in other words, the science behind them um, wasn't accurate. But yes, there are electromagnetic fields around the body, and they, those electromagnetic fields do change 
um, as a function of emotional state, physical exertion, all those things that I yeah, talked about. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're real, it's just that Carilion photography doesn't measure, measure no, them. No, I, I was just mentioning that as something which I had read decades ago. I was just curious how the scientific community now um, translates that. It, it, and, and absolutely. Which what you are doing. Yeah. yeah, no, it, de it definitely has um, an analog, and, and uh, you know, these things are very real, and, but there's, um, as in science, there's lots and lots of caveats, and we can't go too far with, I mean, for example, you know, emotional state um, is a function of context, um, uh, and that context may be motion, it may be um, environment, it may be all of these different things, so you can't magically um, color map um, your physiological signals um, and then say your aura is purple. And, and say, okay, that's what you feel. Um, but the research is actually moving forward on doing not exactly that, but uh, recognizing patterns within these fields and seeing can we, what can we infer from those patterns, um, other pathologies or emotional states or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. It seems like the power of that kind of, I don't want to call it a hoax, but I mean, or like some kind of, the aura, like aura photography is a hoax. Um, it, the power of it is that there's some sense in which we sort of all feel that that must be true. Right? That there's something about when you meet someone who is in a bad mood, they sort of give off some. So I, I, I'm okay with that kind of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> talk. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking about that, that how are they measuring you and your kind of feeling? Right. And, and, yeah, yeah. and the, but, these are. The truly has nothing to do with if there are, I mean, I, and I'm totally non scientific, <laughs> um, but, um, but obviously we all know that it's all scientific. Mm, yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's great. It's fascinating. And it, it also creates an, something Jamie just said. Um, it creates an incredibly intimate environment when you start measuring these things across audiences and people and their energy and exertion and things like that. Um, it was one of the, the most profound effects of, of um, the piece that we worked on last summer was people were you know, really intimately involved in these things because, the, um, because they're directly measuring things that are happening in the body without being mediated by cognitive physical activity. In your, in your yes, exactly. I mean, we're used to wearing these masks. Um, original work on emotion detection was looking at facial recognition and speech. Um, and we're used to, used to that. We're used to the communications that Jamie just referred to of knowing when somebody is angry. And, and some of that is um, facial recognition, speech recognition. It's also, we actually are pretty good at looking at temperature by watch, looking at flushing of the face and <laughs> things like that. So we're actually pretty good mm -hmm. at detecting all of those things. But we're still, um, we can cognitively control a lot of that. But when, once you bypass these physical gestures to the direct electrical energy that's being created, it becomes a much more intimate and sometimes too intimate environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Thomas, sort of I think. Um, in the theory of like phenomenology, the perception is seen as an active gesture, um, and, and uh, visual illusions and hallucinations and so forth are sort of an example of how it is in fact an active system. Um, and you have that slide where you're sort of like bypassing the physical gesture by sensing these emotional states, and I wonder if that's maybe not really how we want to look at it. Um, certainly it's like it's accessing like a, a more interesting level of like uh, brain activity in, in a certain way. But I wonder if we really are trying to bypass the gesture. Um, it's, it's kind of related to the, the question just before because it I mean in a way it is reductionist, right? Like that you're you're kind of using all the all those cues that you just mentioned are kind of what I meant by feeling someone's energy, like all the flushing and the, but when you reduce it to something like bio, bioelectronic signals, <coughs> are you getting the same, is that what you mean sort of? Are you getting the same kind of full picture of a kind of? Yeah. Uh, well, well, also like in, in biofeedback, for example, um, basically we're using these types of sensors to learn how to control those things which were previously thought to be out of control. Um, so I'm, ju I'm just saying that it's an active system. Mm. It's definitely um, can be an active system, and, and you're definitely in, in control of it. So there's a couple comments. One is that 
not saying that that is the wave of the future and must be how all things go. So, because um, you're, you're asking, is that something that we need to do? And the answer is no. Um, uh, the, but the second question about, um, uh, you know, is, is this an active control process? Are you in control of it? I, I think that more and more the feeling is absolutely, well, I mean, gosh, going way back to the Russian experiments where they were doing serious ANS control, uh, autonomic nervous system control experiments where people were really trying to do that. Um, uh, I think that there is certainly an element of act, um, active control that you can impart on it. But, you know, the ones very obvious are breathing and heart rate. I mean, right now I'm in active control of my breathing. I just did it. I can completely control it, but I can also let it function autonomically. And those changes in the function of the autonomic system um, reveal interesting um, correlations to things like emotional and cognitive state. And how you use those revealings is really the artistic side of things. It's a tool. That's one in a set of palette of, of tools that you can use. And, and there certainly is absolutely a level of control on that. As a matter of fact, I'm very much hoping um, from a performance standpoint that there is a level of control. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> go ahead, back there. Talk to the voice. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did use this ostensibly. I mean, the idea is that, you know, for example, the, I think the Federson piece I was showing, like, there's, there's a sense in which sculptors, you know, do brass casts that are going to last, you know, within lifetimes of forever. Um, and so strategies for electronic artists to do that is maybe the interesting part. What do you think of uh, technology seems like a, a lot of the time you know, when I buy a replacement sort of battery for my iPod or there's this question about things being engineered to fall apart after so many years. And what you're doing is trying to go against that and return to a design that's so good that it doesn't ever need to, to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think there's forces of that nature. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean one of the ones I always recognize right is the miniaturization, right? Everyone thinks of miniaturization as this massively futuristic idea, but really a lot of the motivation behind that is keeping you from being able to fix things. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the more layers you put in a PCB and the, and the smaller you make those little bits, the harder it is for me to get that little bit off and <laughs> replace it. Um, and that motivation is well documented in, you know, sort of electrical engineering journals and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly think there's, I don't know how sinister it is, it's just capitalism. Yeah, no, there's nothing secret about it. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Relating it back to your art, then, if you want, if you made something, you wanted it to last forever. Would you document it in such a way such that, you know, it, would you make it open source so that anyone could come back and fix it, you know, if they respected your original design? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big part of what some of these motivations, like the, the motivations around just sort of localized autonomies of community, are very much about that, right? About the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of this technological kind of energy or the or the, the knowledge energy that that Brian talked about a bit. And I think that's all part of, part of it. You know, it's a, it's a larger topic of creative ecology and how you how you kind of manage that in ways that maybe don't rely so much on institutional or um, you know hierarchical relationships to universities. And so do you think it's a return to the start of the market? Someone else got much money and they're trying to make something that gives them as much of a return for themselves. Uh, start, st I don't know. Yeah, starving art. I'm not sure if I have a real profile of what starving artist means now. <laughs> but I think it's certainly a return to, uh, within technology, um, understanding relationships more than objects. If that's a return. <laughs> Taku. Yeah, I guess one of the difficult um, aspects of this discussion is that the, the practicality parts, like yeah. the, 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 the return, like for example your instrument, you know, when you show it to us, it's, the result is really poor <laughs> to what we have. <laughs> no, it, it, it's poor to our standards of yeah. today, right? And also what Brian was talking about, sustainable, sustainability, the whole idea of it is, is sort of kind of an impossible 
idea to to sustain the state that we are in. And so in a way, our aesthetics and our taste has to be kind of reshaped. Um, yeah, and that's one of the I have a couple ways. So, so yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering that, well, yeah, our taste right now is so much, our aesthetic is so much formed by what we have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like yesterday's concert, I wanted it to be louder and louder. <laughs> um, but if, if we follow this pursuit from ground up, you know, some things have to change or some, some aesthetics or some decisions or standards might be reshaped. But I wonder what, what are some of the things you think on that? Yeah. I mean, you, anybody else want to? Um, well, you, you said yesterday, sort of, your, your, your instruments you choose are chosen for durability. Mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of like the first step, you know. You don't choose something that's going to fall apart in two years. You make a, a conscious decision and you spend more than you usually would knowing that that would last for a long time. Someone else was mentioning that, you know, they have a really nice keyboard because that's really important to them because they do a lot of typing. And this was kind of on the, the, the Viridian thing I was talking about. It was kind of like spending more on the things that are actually like really essential to you, the things that you keep close, like the shoes, you, you know. Yeah. It's not really necessarily, it's just probably about buying less crap and buying bets, you know, kind of sending a signal that you're actually interested in buying something that's a bit better than the status quo. And I, I would say making something. things. I mean, yeah. not to, uh, I mean, we have to buy things. But, um, like, to me it seems like the, no matter what, if you want to get into the, the sort of artistic or the aesthetic considerations, right, you're always talking about constraint systems. And, and what I guess I'm starting to become more and more interested in is the constraint systems and infrastructures that re actually reflect my values, as opposed to the ones that don't. You know, And I have that choice as an artist. I can do anything I want. And so that's a really powerful sort of motivation for me to get into this stuff, is like, you don't have to choose that company. You don't have to choose that route. I mean, and it, by the way, as much like, um, Ben was saying it doesn't have to be the only thing. It's just a aesthetic, right? Like me in the park in the cracker box was an extremely interesting experience for me. But it's not the it's not what you'll see tonight, right? When I when I burn off about ten kilowatts of sound and light. But where do you think the bridge is? I don't know that there has to be one yeah. any more than there has to be one between you know goats and chickens. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a bridge there. We yeah. Won't go to that. <laughs> um, but I, I think I mean, talk about I think too that it is um, not not to beat an agenda because it's not an agenda. But the what I've found you, know, you want to turn this thing up to you know to eleven last night. Um, what that does is um, and what's the difference between that and wanting to walk up very closely to the speaker um, and listening to this the. You know, in that environment, to me, it's a lot of when I start to become more energy efficient and look at energies and things like that and conservation, it becomes a more intimate environment. And um, even even doing the things like what um, Jamie showed of cranking things, if people get to or the, oh, I love the car, people are getting together in the car. They're having to work together, and and that there, it creates again this level of intimacy between the people doing things in a coordinated action. And, and it becomes, what I find, the, the difference in the aesthetic is that um, in this modern world of putting a lot of power into things and, excuse me, cranking up to 11, is that, um, that a lot of that intimacy is lost. And then when you try to bring it back, there's a level of un uncomfort in that. I have a video of the piece that we did last summer. And um, some, of the pieces, some of the people in there were leaning forward and really involved in it and really involved in the actors that were involved and some people were sitting like Jamie is um, with their arms <laughs> um, back. Yes, exactly. They Sorry. Did the, perfe the perfect gesture. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't. No, but that was, that was exactly the, this kind of, um, this is too intimate. I don't like this. This is, this is too much in my face. And it's funny that that whispering can be more in your face than cranking something up to 11. Um, uh, which to me was, was But that's what I'm saying is not an either or decision. You know, this is one way for, for example, me to work. And I find this interesting for certain reasons, but there are other, you know, that's what makes it different than sort of zealotry and I think judgmentalism. And, you know, it becomes an aesthetic constraint, a kind of interesting way of looking at musical problems in the same way that there's this kind of, there's a symbiosis between technologies and, and music kind of expressed throughout this whole week, right? And I think this is one of those 
kind of sides of that. I think you could have this be one of those relationships where you're kind of investigating technologies and, and musical implications of that. I think there was one more question there. Yeah, and there's examples at, uh, what's that massively annoying techno festival in the UK? Glastonbury? I mean, they have a sound stage that's powered by a bunch of guys on bikes and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not that that's the same aesthetic. I know the pieces you mean, and they're, they're very elegant, but, um, and I think that that's also kind of interesting, but it, it is, I think, more in the way of trying to serve another aesthetic with this kind of idea, which is what makes it kind of yeah. seem a disingenuous. <coughs> Embarrassment and apologies to for using the word environmental or yeah. anything related to dreams and sustainability. Yeah. I wonder if we can just get beyond that. Yeah, that would be great. Do you have any ideas as to how? <laughs> yeah, I think there are some quite simple things that may seem to hold back some of the discussion. I was really surprised by Brian's uh, comment that the human ecology is the main ecology. Well, we, I mean, it's it's I mean, it's shown that you know humans have the well, okay. We no, after after like the world, you know, humans have moved more more land mass than any other kind of organism. Yeah, but I, I think that, that that very attitude is the anthropocentric attitude that we need to get beyond. And then he followed it with the the example of David Dunn and his bark beetles, and that yeah. project very cleverly and clearly shows that bark beetles are oh. sophisticated ecologists, okay. yes, probably they are. more sophisticated than us. And they're actually and affecting the climate. That, yeah. yeah, the Luminous Green project mm. also goes in that direction. It talks oh, yeah. about plants and understanding plant yeah. and chemical um, ecology what? that is beyond the human, if you like. And I think mm -hmm. that kind of situation of us might help think about energy efficiency and uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the nomenclature issue is uh, is just a nomenclature issue, by the way. I think the reason I hesitate to use those kinds of words and such is just because they've been co-opted in a way mm -hmm. lately yeah, sure. that I just don't like. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I was in a the sustainably sustainable what's it called sustainable art the sustainable research art group at IBM, yeah. and I just got so tired of the way that they were using the word um, because for the most part it was it was a, a a way of getting yourself into certain communities and yeah, seen by certain audiences mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. I'm trying, yeah. <laughs> but I think the first, I mean, I, I'm not that embarrassed about saying it. I just didn't want to derail the conversation into that mm -hmm. kind of co-opted version of it, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, th I think um, maybe the answer to this is, is like, like every, whenever we're talking about like autonomy from the grid, I think that's kind of like a good thing because it's it has a lot of enables a lot of things like portability mm -hmm. um, and sort of freedom of these technologies. Um, so you're not a slave to the wall work. Um, yeah. On 
on the other hand, like, like uh, using humans to like put them in bicycles and make them batteries, um, to me, doesn't really do much unless that is really enabling something else that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Because in fact, all the losses in that system actually just make it less efficient. Right. In well, I mean, speakers, except for the, uh, the sort of artistic and aesthetic implications of it, right? I mean, it's the experience of that is quite... The experience and, yeah, like, yeah. for example, your art generator um, is interesting for that reason. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that's where, like, sort of the buzzwords of, like, you just, like, get an exercise by pretty much. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's <laughs> we were that's talking this morning about, about if this actually, I mean, if we were being zealous about it and we really wanted the whole world to do this in, in, that, in that sense, would everybody have to eat a lot more? Exactly. Right. <laughs> and what are the inefficiencies of that? We already eat a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we don't need to eat much more. Yeah. We just need better. Yeah. Like these standard comments about like growing your own food, you know, it keeps you healthy twice while you're growing it and then while you're eating it. And this idea of you're producing your own energy in order to power some some installation, then it's just. I don't know. I, the comment I wanted to make before when you're talking about these kind of parasitic energy devices. Yeah. I mean, all they, they I mean, they're called parasitic for a reason. They're not symbiotic energy yeah. devices. They're all they're going to do is, like, if you have a pressure harnessing thing on your shoe, it just makes it ever so slightly harder to walk. And yeah. all of these other things are always going to be provided some extra load. Right. Um, I like this art generator piece because it's really clear. It's like, okay, we're going to turn like mechanical energy into power and turn it into art. So here. Do the most efficient way of a human creating art, uh, mechanical energy, which is like leaning on a big rod. Right. And um, I, mean, <laughs> I kind of like these ideas. Instead of this idea of sort of pretending that somehow you're walking and you're creating all of this excess energy, which can somehow be harnessed, but, but harnessed, but it's really what's going on. The most of those kind of technologies come from this idea of ubiquitous computing, where they just want uh, you know you to not have to think about the fact that you're powering all of this. Uh, right. Yeah. You're I don't use parasitic. I've never like parasitic is somehow creeped into energy harvesting lingo, right. but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. But is the inner energy uh, the sort of the thermal differential? That is that free? Well, no, <laughs> nothing is free. Heisenberg, oh, okay. Heisenberg can walk into this room at any moment um, no, 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 no. And, and have a field day. Yeah, okay, is it? Is it we're, we're invading this. We're sucking energy off the sun even oh, as actually, we speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, the, with, the thing is that there's inefficiencies of um, coal to energy, mm. and then do, can you harvest the um, ambient things that are created in the, um, that are byproduct of it? So putting sensors on your shoes. Well, first of all, I'm not going to put one on to power a light bulb. Um, but if I want a sensor in my shoe that actually measures my walk because I want to do something like holy for some reason as part of an artistic piece, then being able to harvest that energy locally is an interesting aspect of it. And the mere energy harvesting has a creative element um, to it. Yeah, that's right. Yes? No, I think I'm just curious, how, how much is the, um, the aesthetic of, of making art with these, um, with these new techniques? Uh, connected once they're connected. Uh, so in other words, it's the, it's the artistic uh, motivation at the moment very much connected with, with creating the possibilities to uh, pieces of art that way. And what other aesthetics, I suppose, any aesthetics you use to fit into the technique you're now developing? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I totally get it. Yeah, and that's what that's what you're addressing. Is, that, is it changing it? Because I mean, what what was what, is it the car or the horse, right? Like, yeah. I, yeah. I, my total motivation. I mean, the reason that I you know sort of show this dorky picture of a Donkey Kong thing for this guy, right, is has got very very little to do <laughs> with any kind of sustainable or uh, anything else except for making it portable, really. But I just know that what I want to do with it is quite simple and kind of gamey and sort of fun. And so I'm not that interested in having, I don't need a lot of power. And so I figured, well, what better way to do that than have it just last forever without a battery, without all that kind of, you know, make a crackle box that is never going to need recharging. Um, and so that, that is that horse before that car. I do think some of them are related in terms of just being this sustainable environmental art movement thing, um, which I'm not sure if I, I'm all that interested in. It's a little bit like the new media community in the early 90s, right? It's just because it plugged in, it was in the same show 
or just because you know there's an implication that there was some kind of commonality whereas the themes being addressed are actually quite different so that's my thought on that mine is how is that reflected in what you just said about the you know using things that correspond to your values to my what to your values right you said that a while ago yeah yeah well it's not you know you're using like a really pragmatic argument like you know I don't want to fuck around with batteries so yeah I'm taking this approach there are two different things right I mean choosing this path because you have some values that are about the environment or sustainability or yeah I don't know that they, that they're definitely different. I don't know that they can, but they're, I mean, why not have them be mutually applied? I don't mind developing, you know, interesting techniques for artists who also have that motivation as a result of something that I'm trying to do. That's, again, the common, I think, symbiosis between music and technology anyway. You know, we end up pushing both fields somehow. <coughs> Hopefully. But yeah, they are different, for sure. Open sound control, by the way. It's way more efficient. Is it? <laughs> I think that might really? be a lie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All set? Okay, well, thanks again. Thanks, guys. Thank so we're going to have our last session of this whole Jeff Michael Jamboree at 3. It's going to be a, a, a round table. Um, all of you guys will be discussing numerous topics. So I hope you'll be there at 3 and then we'll have a concert again tonight at 3. Uh, so we'll be back at 3.